Let me just move this far. Okay, I'm going to talk about fractures of the hand. We're going to start from the metacarpal and work our way, way down to the distal phalanx. Then I'm going to talk about PIP joint dislocations and then end uh, with PIP fracture dislocations. It's very important to remember that fractures in the hand are not just injuries to bone. Non-union in the hand is rare, meaning fractures will almost always heal in the hand. However, they leave behind a soft tissue crisis commonly. And what that means is either joint stiffness or tendon adhesions. Uh, one little thing is the FDP lies on directly adjacent to the proximal phalanx, as you can see here. So when this fracture heals with the proximal phalanx, it often entraps the FDP tendon. Uh, I've seen two or three younger people who've had to have tendon releases, basically adhesions removed from the FDP uh, to get regain their active range of motion. As everybody should know, the extensors lie very tightly on the dorsum of the proximal and middle phalanges. So any type of fracture of the middle and uh, proximal phalanges can adhere to the eccentric tendons as well. 10% of all fractures occur in the hand. The most common is the distal phalanx and the least common is the middle phalanx. Factors that predispose fractures to a poor outcome include open fractures, intraarticular fractures, fractures associated with nerve and tendon injury, and crush injuries. It's very important to know that uh, when you have a hand fracture, meaning if you think you, you see a metacarpal injury, you need to get a hand x-ray. This sounds kind of stupid, but often people have wrist x-rays for hand injuries. You need a hand x-ray if you're gonna look for metacarpal fractures. Uh, if, if you're at home, look at the side or the lateral view of your hand. If you pronate your hand 30 degrees, you'll be able to better see the fourth and fifth CMC joints. So if you're suspecting a hamate fracture or a fourth and fifth CMC injury, you need to order a 30 degree pronated lateral. That's often on your in-training. Similarly, uh, you order a 30 degree supinated lateral to assess the second and third CMC joints. Again, just look at the side view of your hand and supinate it 20 to 30 degrees, and you'll see how that would profile the second and third CMC joints better. You must request a finger x-ray for each finger injury. Do not get a hand x-ray for a finger injury. This x-ray here shows a fracture that was missed because they did not get a true lateral of the finger. They got a hand x-ray. And on the x-ray of the hand, the fingers can be superimposed on the lateral. So you will miss an injury like this. Again, it sounds stupid, but get a finger x-ray if you think you have a finger injury. A couple critical findings in hand fractures that are somewhat unique to hand injuries. Number one is rotation. Rotation is often a clinical assessment, not a radiographic assessment. You can pick uh, gross, ro gross rotation uh, up on an x-ray, but often it's a clinical finding. The trick is to have the fingers flex simultaneously. If in your normal hand, you make a fist with everything but your small finger, and then you bend your small finger, your small finger will overlap your ring finger and that's uninjured. So that you gotta have the patient move their fingers simultaneously. Now that's hard to do when the finger's injured, uh, but you can slowly have them flex simultaneously and any malrotation should be pretty evident as shown here in the right picture. Again, it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to do to ask somebody with a you know, fractured finger to bend their finger, but you have to get some kind of sense. A shortening is often uh, associated with rotation. So if you have a spiral fracture where the shortening on the x-ray shows five to 10 millimeters of shortening, then you really need to think this is probably malrotated. So really do a good clinical assessment. Let's move on to metacarpal fractures. Transverse fractures almost always angulate dorsally. This is Dr. Littler's diagram here. The strong flexor tendons flex the uh, metacarpal head down. They are treated with a cast or a splint if they're non-displaced. One thing you need to remember about, inter or about metacarpal fractures is that interosseous can be interposed within the fracture site. So if your closed reduction is unable to be obtained, then you need to suspect that there's interosseous muscle or fascia within the fracture site, and you may need to open it. 
Uh, treatment involves uh, either an IM screw, which is gaining in popularity. I've done a couple, they're nice. Uh, I typically use an intermedullary K wire, just a single one in retrograde fashion, uh, 0.045 inches if it's a smaller hand or 0.062 K wire if it's a bigger hand. Oblique fractures in the metacarpal. I typically use K wires for almost everything. So that'll be my go-to answer. I typically do this percutaneously. Interfragmentary screws can be used and I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. Uh, the key is that the fracture has to be a long obliquity. And how do you define that? The definition of that is the length of the fracture must be greater than twice the diameter of the bone. So if it's a very long obliquity, you can use three lag screws. Uh, sometimes for competitive athletes or musicians, uh, we use a plate for an unstable short oblique fracture and that allows them to uh, get back to sports and music earlier. So here's a typical case uh, with a little traction and I use my fracture clamps and I put one tine here and one tine here. Uh, you can pull on the fracture and then you kind of toggle with your clamps and reduce this anatomically and you can use a three transverse K wires. I think these are three 0.035 K wires in this younger person. Here's a long oblique fracture of the second metacarpal. Uh, again, if, it's, if the obliquity is long enough so that it's wider or longer than the width of this times two, then you can use these three lag screws. Metacarpal neck fractures are caused by a direct blow to the metacarpal head. They're apex dorsal with pretty bad volar comminution depending on uh, how hard the guy punched the wall in anger. Um, as everybody sees these. Uh, what's interesting about this, these injuries is that the treatment varies greatly from uh, within the United States and then all over the globe. Uh, if they're less than 40 degrees angulated, uh, typically we try to reduce them and splint them. Um, so I know some parts of the country and most of the world probably use just an A-strap and lets them go and doesn't see them again for follow-up. In New York City, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive with these. So if they're flexed down more than 50 degrees or so, or if there's any malrotation, we typically do a close reduction and pinning in the operating room. Rarely do I put a plate and screws on this. And this is typically what we do. Uh, if the, the fractures flex down, um, we do a little, little surgery. We just un, you know, deflex it with the Joss maneuver and put a single pin down it. That pin comes out in three to four weeks. Without surgery, you need to warn the people that they're gonna lose their knuckle contour. Um, and most people don't care, but some people do. And you just don't, you just wanna make sure they know that if they choose non-operative treatment. Proximal phalanger fractures, if they're transverse, almost all angulate volally. Again, here's a Dr. Littler diagram demonstrating, here's the pull within inner osseae, flexing this piece down and the extensors extend the fracture, giving you the volar angulation. Indications for surgery include greater than 10 degrees of angulation or shortening of more than one to two millimeters. Options include, again, in my case, intramedullary K wires. Uh, plating is a bit tricky for phalanger fractures, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, there's been some recent publications on intramedullary screws for something like this, and I think that's a good option as well, although we're still trying to learn the finer points of the surgical techniques. So for oblique and spiral fractures of the phalanges, I typically use uh, transverse K wires after I achieve a reduction. Interfragmentary screws can be used if it's a long obliquity and plates for a shorter obliquity. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, tendon adhesions are very common uh, after phalanger fractures, especially if you put a plate on uh, a proximal or middle phalanx. So that's probably the least common option in something like this. So some specific fractures. Phalangeal condylar fractures are pretty tricky. The problem is, is that displacement of this fracture leads to two problems. One, articular incongruity. You can see the gap and step here of the joint. And two, some pretty impressive clinical angulation. Uh, this finger is pretty deviated as you can see clinically here. So these are pretty common injuries and fraught with complications because initially non-displaced fractures can displace so what happens is they come in, there's a non-displaced condylar fracture. You say it's non-displaced, we don't need to operate on it right now. And then every week you follow it, it kind of drifts slowly, slowly, slowly. So at four weeks, now you have this x-ray where it's displaced, the finger's crooked and now it's healed. Um, so 
I typically try to pin them when they're non-displaced, even though that seems counterintuitive, but at least you avoid this complication of having a malunion or a nascent malunion at four weeks. Another problem is if you have to open it and you do extensive stripping of the fracture to get it reduced, you can create AVN or avascular necrosis of that condyle. Another reason just to pin it at the beginning of the presentation. Options include K wires or screws. Uh, I typically use two to three K wires. Some surgeons use two or three interfragmentary screws. Peter Stern published, published an article showing there is no different, difference in the outcomes between screws and pins. Uh, I've done a fair amount of both. In my experience, the pins uh, have less of a scar uh, and they, they never need to come out and they interfere with the collateral ligaments less. So I tend to pin these. Um, although the downside is you can't move them early. They, they are in a cast for three to four weeks. One little tidbit about middle phalanx refractions that everybody needs to remember. The middle phalanx has relatively less cancellous bone in the diaphysis than the phalanges in the metacarpal. What does that mean? This is more of a diaphyseal injury, like a femur diaphysis, and not a metadiaphyseal injury like most of the hand fractures that we discuss. So therefore, it takes longer to heal. So you need to keep the cast or pins in place for an extra week, so five weeks for an injury like this and not four weeks. When I was a fellow, I saw uh, one of my attendings pull a pin and a young girl who had a fracture like this at three and a half to four weeks and the fracture fell apart. Uh, and we had to do a, a big surgery with a plate and screws and her finger never regained a good range of motion. So keep those pins in for an extra week for middle phalanx fractures. Distal phalanx fractures are the most common fracture in the hand. Uh, what to do about the nail bed, that always comes up. Uh, conventional wisdom says to repair the nail bed if there's greater than 50% of a sublingual hematoma. And I think that's a bit aggressive. I think it's better to remove the nail plate and fix the nail bed if there's a blottable nail. And what that means is the nail is so elevated by blood below it that when you push on the nail plate, it, it's blottable, it's kind of spongy because it's essentially detached by the hematoma. In that case, I think you should take the nail plate off and repair the nail bed. Otherwise, if it's 40 to 50% of a sublingual hematoma, I think it's okay just to drain it and let it be. One other thing that happens to distal phalangeal injuries is the nail bed can be evulsed from the cul-de-sac. So what happens is the nail bed gets pulled out from below the cuticle, flips over the cuticle, and then pinches the cuticle. Not only if, if you miss this, will you, could you get an infection, but you can also severely scar the cuticle by it being on top or the nail bed being on top of the cuticle. So don't miss this. We see one of these, my partners and I see one of these every six months where someone missed this in the emergency room. Most distal phalanger fractures heal, although not, only, not always with a solid bony union. If you see on x-rays, a fibrous union is common. Uh, one thing to remember about the distal phalanx is that the nail matrix can be interposed in the fracture. So this is an open fracture. And if you see this in the emergency room, it should be treated as such with irrigation and antibiotics. If this is unable to be reduced, you need to suspect there's an interposed nail bed right in this area. Um, the splinting is most common uh, for these fractures. However, for a shaft fracture, like I just showed with some displacement and angulation, you may wanna pin it. When you put the pin down, you wanna avoid distraction. And again, if there's a big fracture gap, suspect interposed nail bed, and you may need to open it and remove that little nail bed from the spot. Another particular type of fracture is a bony mallet fracture. This is an intraarticular fracture of the base of the distal phalanx. This is a very common injury we see in our practice. And you have to remember that the fracture fragment includes the extensor tendon insertion, which is why they get this droop. The treatment is pretty controversial and it depends on the size of the piece, the displacement, and DIP joint subluxation. And if you ask 10 surgeons on this uh, webinar, I'd say we'd give you three or four different answers on how to treat these. So I think in general, if there's no DIP joint subluxation, you can see here a line drawn down the middle phalanx. It goes through the distal phalanx. So there's no subluxation. Um, you can splint these, meaning not operate on them. I would be concerned about a couple things though. One, this is a pretty big fracture fragment. I think in general, that means the joint may be more unstable and I'd keep a close eye on this. 
The other thing to remember is if you put an extension splint on this type of fracture and you pre-bend the splint a little bit, then you may cause volar subluxation by pushing the distal phalanx volarly. So in a fracture like this, I would just put a straight alumifoam splint on. Most soft tissue mallet injuries, I actually create a little hyperextension in the splint so that it can heal fully straight. At least we try. If there's DIP joint volar subluxation, like you can see on the below x-ray, in my opinion, you should probably have surgery on this unless the person's infirm or elderly or, or just refuses surgery. But in general, for younger, more active people, I'd recommend a, a pinning of this injury. We wrote up the technique on this about 15 years ago. Uh, you extend the DIP joint. I get my, uh, my friendly fracture clamp here and I reduce, I put one tine here and one tine here and I reduce the fracture anatomically. The first thing you do is you insert a longitudinal 3-5K wire down the medulloid canal, retrograde fashion. And then uh, I typically use three 2-8K wires to, to capture that fracture fragment. The 2-8K wires run dorsal proximal to volar distal. Those pins remain in for about five weeks and then you can take them out. A Bennett fracture is a fracture dislocation of the thumb metacarpal. You have to remember that the palmar fragment, this palmar fragment here, which is attached to the volar beak ligament, that's the anatomic position of the thumb. The metacarpal is actually subluxated and it's displaced dorsally and proximally uh, by two tendons, specifically the abductor pollicis longus, the APL, and the adductor pollicis. This is often on the intraining. The reduction maneuver. Um, I always think of it as just grabbing a beer can, traction, extension, pronation, and abduction. So in surgery, when you're pulling on the thumb, that's kind of the position to hold a beer can. Non-displaced Bennett fractures can be casted, although this is very rare. I typically pin these. Again, uh, that's what I typically do. I insert K wires into things. The K wires can run in a bunch of different directions. After it's reduced, you can put a K wire from the metacarpal into the trapezium a pin, sorry, a pin into, from the metacarpal into the trapezium, a pin from the metacarpal into the second metacarpal. I often try to place a pin from the dorsal aspect of the thumb into the volar fracture fragment to try to make it look pretty. Here's a picture uh, after an ORIF uh, using screws. ORIF is common for uh, missed injuries that are three or four weeks old. It's a fun operation to do. You do it to the Wagner approach or the Theonor musculature. Um, and these screws are fix things well. It's just a little bit more complicated than pinning it if you can. Rolando fracture is a comminuted displaced interarticular fracture of the thumb metacarpal base. These are difficult injuries to treat because these are high energy. There's lots of comminution as, and often the joint is kind of uh, pretty incongruous and kind of blown apart. Look at all these pieces of bone here. So uh, that's a really bad injury to the thumb. Treatment options include pinning, which is my, my first choice if possible, open reduction, internal fixation using plates and screws. This is not my case, but this is well done. Often, uh, this is a pretty tough thing to do because of the multiple fracture fragments. Uh, Dr. Gelbrin wrote up an article on dynamic skeletal traction where you place a K wire through the metacarpal, attach it to a splint, which is an outrigger on the hand. Uh, and that's a pretty effective treatment as well. So let's move on to PIP dislocations. Dorsal dislocations are very common. Lateral are less common than palmar or rare. Dorsal dislocations, they're most always reducible. In fact, I, I don't think I've ever seen one that's been irreducible. If they're irreducible, uh, it's either the FDS or lateral band that's interposed in the joint. Uh, obviously, if it's irreducible, it requires open treatment. Uh, once reduced, these are generally stable. Now the catch is the emergency room typically puts the finger in a splint and extension, which is the least stable position for the finger. So you really wanna splint them in slight flexion for three to five days, have them come back get an x-ray to make sure it looks good still, and then buddy tape them for three weeks to start really active range of motion so they don't get stiff. Lateral dislocations, I've seen a couple of these. The close reduction trick is via traction and rotation because you're trying to make sure the uh, P1 head or the proximal phalangeal head does not get stuck right in this orange arrow here. And that's the noose between the central slip and the lateral band. If it does get stuck there, it becomes irreducible. 
and it requires surgery. Palmer dislocations. Two things to remember about uh, Palmer PIP dislocations. One is the close reduction maneuver, traction with MP and PIP joints flexed to decrease tension on the volary displaced lateral band. So that's one thing. You got to have the joints flex while you try to reduce it. And then second, you have to assume that there's been a central slip rupture from a volar displacement of the middle phalanx. If you miss this and don't treat it, you're gonna get a boutonniere deformity. So unfortunately, these injuries require six weeks of full extension of the PIP joint. Uh, obviously that makes the finger very stiff, but at least allows the central slip to heal. Let's talk about fracture dislocations. Uh, the dorsal fracture dislocations are pretty common. The Palmer dislocations are rare. In fact, this is the only one I've ever seen. So what you have to remember for PIP fracture dislocations is whether they're stable or unstable in flexion. And uh, they're stable when the middle phalanx does not subluxate dorsally on the proximal phalangeal head. So here, this joint is flexed about 60 degrees and the PIP joint looks pretty congruent. Uh, usually, if the fracture fragment here is less than 40% of the articular surface, then it's going to be a stable injury. Now, that's not always the case, but that's the kind of the rough guideline, 40%. Uh, one thing you need to remember, and you always look for this, is this dorsal V sign. So if the V is wide up top here, wider than it should be, or you can even get a contralateral finger x-ray, then the joint is not perfectly reduced. In fact, this joint you could argue is probably not perfectly reduced. It may be a little wide up here, um, but you gotta be careful for this dorsal V sign because that will lead to incongruity of the joint. So if they're stable, meaning if the joint is reduced in flexion, then you can treat them with the dorsal extension block splinting or casting. The good thing about this is you can flex the finger so they don't get that stiff. Um, and then you would change the cast every week or so a decreasing degree of flexion up to about six weeks. The catch is you have to see them every week in your office and you have to get really good lateral x-rays to make sure there's no dorsal subluxation uh, with a treatment like this. So you're looking for that V sign every week. Requires a lot of time on your part to see them every week and to make a cast or splint like this every week. If the joint is unstable, meaning the middle phalanx subluxates uh, then they need surgery. Again, these are typically bigger fracture fragments, greater than 40% of the middle phalanx. Uh, treatment for this is pretty complicated. There are a bunch of different techniques, which means there's not one great answer. Otherwise, there'd just be one surgical technique. The first thing you would think of is why not just fix these pieces? Uh, well, because it's comminuted, often you can't put screws in it. If it were one big piece, which is rare, then you could put a couple screws in it and make the joint perfect again, but that's often not the case. Dr. Eaton, who's one of my mentors, described the volar plate arthroplasty, which is the figure shown here. In this surgery, you remove the comminuted pieces of the base, you take off the volar plate, you reattach the volar plate into that defect. That works pretty well for small defects. If there's a big defect, however, the problem is, is that the uh, proximal phalangeal head often pushes the volar plate into this defect here, and then the joint subluxates again. So for smaller defects, the volar plate arthroplasty works. For bigger defects, it should be contraindicated. The hemi-hamate autograft is a great uh, relatively newer technique where you take a portion of the hamate from the ipsilateral wrist, you take the top of the bone, you do some carpentry, you flip it over, and you stick it right into this defect and you fix it with two or three screws. Great operation, pretty tricky, but works very well. Kind of the classic technique is external fixation, either static X fixing or using a dynamic rubber bands and K wires. Dr. Strouch, who happens to be our next lecturer, uh, just uh, recently described a technique called the card bopper. Um, here's one of my cases. I'm a big fan of this technique because it uses percutaneous pins, which happens to be my go-to treatment for most of these things. This is a kid who was playing football who jammed his finger and sustained this fracture dislocation. And you can see here, the problem with it is, is he has this impacted articular fragment. So I used a K-wire to insert it through the fracture site to kind of depress the articular surface down. Um, and that looked really good there. And then I used a clamp to reduce the fracture. And then I used uh, three or four pins 
to uh, reduce the fracture and keep the joint reduced. The trick here is when they come to your office, under you have to do a digital block and remove the pins and also uh, have them actively flex against resistance to uh, rupture some of the FDP adhesions that occur using this technique. Thanks. I'm going to stop sharing now and